Hello, and thanks for joining today on this live stream. I'm talking today about mold, and this is going to be a really, really interesting live stream. And why this is going to be fascinating is that we're talking about the relationship that these microorganisms that we can culture out on petri plates and we can use various different types of environmental sampling techniques like tape lifts and optical particle counting and molecular probes and ATP tests. All of these are ways in which we can measure or quantify the microbial world. But one of the things that I'm really, really excited to be talking about today is a summary of this particular paper, which was just published uh, really 10 days ago in the literature. And we're going to be focusing on, um, uh, on this quite um, uh, uh, significantly. And really the focus of this is some really groundbreaking research, which has been appearing with uh, various different authors uh, uh, in, in, in the literature over the last couple of years. But this is coming out uh, of America. And this paper, I consider probably one of the most important publications that's appeared, certainly in the, the last couple of years. And I think it is just a fantastic uh, publication because it validates what so many people who are concerned about the relationship between water damage and mold and mold exposure uh, feel inside their bodies. And this particular paper is really going to focus on how mold has been, in a sense, inextricably linked and now uh, uh, proven to cause memory deficits, increase in anxiety, changes in the perception of pain, and all sorts of impacts on the innate immune system. And basically, we're going to be talking about all of this and more on today's live stream. Uh, but just remember, but this relates to environmental exposure to mold. And in many cases, once we culture this out or use some other way of measuring this, we can make it visible. But in many water damaged building environments, it's just not visible. And so I'm going to uh, change this now for you. In many cases, this is what we find uh, in, in our homes. You'll get some sort of unexpected water breach. And so people often complain about living and working, uh, working in water damaged buildings. And they often, after time, a short period of time, start growing mold. And it's very common for these individuals to suffer from a range of adverse health symptoms. But in many cases, this range of health symptoms is not taken seriously by uh, friends and family and often even uh, members of the medical community. To date, there are no published papers that have done controlled experiments where mold exposure has been linked to brain function until this particular publication. And this appeared, as I said, 10 days ago, in brain behavior and immunity. And I really need to make a shout out to Caleb Rudd, who is a uh, very active member of the uh, Australasian uh, community who is focusing on mold because he really uh, draw, uh, drew my attention to the existence of this publication. Uh, and certainly um, uh, Cheryl Harding over at the uh, City University of New York has been uh, publishing uh, in the last couple of years uh, in uh, about immunity and how various different uh, microorganisms can create a spike in the immune response in uh, uh, rodents. So we're going to be focusing on this latest paper. And basically, the title of this paper is Mold Inhalation Causes Innate Immune Activation Neural, Cognitive and Emotional Dysfunction. And really, this is just a fantastic publication because succinctly in this paper, it draws on so many people's experiences and validates it in an animal model as well. It puts forward an entire model linking the immune system 
and the uh, cognitive system with the um, uh, motor responses that are seen in these rodents. So we're going to be talking about this and uh, unpacking this publication. So as I said, it was published recently. It came out as a preprint on the 18th of November 2019. There are a few tiny little typos in it, and uh, uh, I will point these out um, uh, in one of the graphs because uh, uh, we need to look at that. Now, I would suggest that anyone who has got any type of uh, uh, mold exposure issue who wants to explain to uh, other persons that mold exposure and mold illness is very real, really needs to go to the source, uh, pay for the publication, or at least read the abstract, uh, review the um, live stream and uh, uh, what we're doing here and what is also going to be presented in the show notes underneath this live stream because I'm linking to some other academic articles that will make the whole experience of understanding this publication a little bit more easy. Now, uh, obviously I said that it was uh, Cheryl Harding and co-workers. Every single one of these individuals is from the City University of New York. And they were asking a couple of key questions in their publication. And the first was, would repeated known doses of mold spores cause an innate immune activation? And what they did is they looked at two types of uh, uh, mold spores. And obviously, we all talk about this with its relationship to chronic inflammatory response syndrome to toxic mold. And, you know, the well-known, most well-known example being the Stachybotrys chitarum or the black mold. And then other people who really uh, don't like to consider the ramifications of mold exposure say, oh, well, that particular mold that we found in your property was a non-toxic variety. Or these are normal molds that are, as I said, present out in the uh, atmosphere. And, and you know, as you can see, this is the outdoor uh, 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 control that someone sent through and they're interested in the relationship to their indoor heating. But you know, these are the types of things we're surrounded by these molds all the time. So that is normal. I'm, I'm not disputing that. But the issue is what does happen to your body? What is the underlying physiology? How is this affecting uh, you know, your mood. We've talked about depression before on these live streams, but what about anxiety? What about the fact that many people who call me tell me that they're in pain or that their pain thresholds are altered? So um, in this particular article, they were looking at whether or not the toxic mold, stachybotrys, or a non-toxic version of mold, and how they did that is they actually washed the spores with ethanol to get rid of the immune priming cell wall coat. So it's the same spores, but they are considered inert. And they called these toxic and non-toxic. And then the second question was, when these are presented to the mice, is there a impact on cognition, the emotional response of the rodents, and are there behavioral systems? And of course, this all comes down to something called the innate immune system, which is responsible in our bodies for responding to pathogens. And it is the first response system before you get a, um, a production of these inflammagens or these cytokines, which then allow the body to remember in a sense and then respond to the challenge at a later point in time. So that's what your immune system does and that in its own right is a very complicated uh, uh, um, system and really I won't go into it any further here. But the bottom line is that this publication is touching on all of these areas and brings all of them uh, into, into, into play with their experiment and the findings and the results and the conclusions and the ramifications of this. So this is the infamous black mold, Stachybotrys chitarum. And again, as I said, that they use these spores, washed and unwashed. And in the graphs that I'm about to show you, they labeled them as either toxic or the non-toxic varieties. And of course, they also presented an inert material to the rodents, the mice in this situation, which 
just was saline. So there was no presence of microbial matter, cellular matter, or that sort of thing. And that is called VEH in the publication notes. So what did they do? Well, they got a whole lot of mice, in fact, 122 mice. And yes, I should say at the outset that these mice were sacrificed at the end of the experiment. So we all owe these mice a, a great deal of gratitude and thanks, and especially to the scientists who um, uh, really have put together a, a most elegant paper. Uh, and, and so really these, these, these mice have uh, done a wonderful thing for uh, uh, humanity because from how they responded physiologically and behaviorally and all, uh, this beautiful paper has uh, uh, come into the public domain. And so I also need to touch on something called the hippocampus because the hippocampus is the structural area in the brain which is responsible for learning. And it also allows uh, uh, us and these mice to make goal-oriented behaviors and it allows them to move about in space. And so this is really at the entry of the spinal cord uh, uh, into the brain stem, and it's quite closely uh, connected to other important regions of the brain, which are responsible for uh, you know, temperature and hunger and fatigue uh, and all of that. So uh, this area of the hippocampus has been postulated as being inextricably uh, impacted on by environmental threats. And so this is one of the core uh, uh, cognitive uh, locations that uh, the researchers were looking to find. And, and what they did with all of these experiments is, apart from testing them out for learning and, and, and anxiety and uh, a controlled fear, uh, eventually they were sacrificed and they examined their brain um, uh, they examined their brains. So basically they were able to look at the amount of neurons or what are called neurogenesis, that is the branching or the ability of the brain to actually develop because they got mice at two different ages to uh, reflect very young uh, mice and, and, and older mice. Now, before I get into the beautiful graphs, I want to paint you a word picture for what they did. So basically, one of the first things that they looked at was um, allowing the mice to inhale different concentrations of these mold spores. And what they did is they got a, a microscope like, like I've got right next to me here, and something called a hemocytometer, which allows you to measure out known concentrations of, of, of spores. And basically, they made some different uh, conditions that they uh, then um, induced the mice to uh, breathe this in. So the mice inhaled these mold spores. And again, they were 400 spores, 4,000 spores, or 15,000 spores. So they had a gradient from no to low, medium, and high concentrations of mold spores. And then they looked at what happened to the mice when they were placed into a maze. And this maze essentially was very much like a T intersection that you would find on any road. But unlike a T intersection, it had uh, one plank in a sense without walls and one where there were walls. So this uh, provides an environment, a local environment, which can either uh, induce some uh, uh, amount of fear in the rodents. And you can imagine that they might want to seek shelter uh, uh, behind the wall, uh, or if they're feeling particularly adventurous, they will spend more time out in the open. So this is a classical maze experiment, which is used in a lot of research that is looking at uh, uh, how the brain influences behavior. And again, image analysis is used uh, to track the time that the mouse spent in each of the different areas of the maze. And when they're looking at conditioned fear, this is what it actually looks like in reality. What they did is that they, in order to work out whether the mouse is actually learning something, they played a sound. 
a repeatable sound for 15 seconds and they also applied a very small shock to the foot of the mouse. And they wanted to look at whether or not the mouse would either freeze, that is stand still in fear before moving away. And then by measuring the time that the mouse froze when in future experiments, when they didn't shock the foot, but they just played the sound, that allowed them to work out whether or not the uh, mouse is able to learn over time or actually remember things. And so this issue is if it associates the sound with the foot shock, then how long will it take before the mouse moves away? And that essentially is how they established this issue of conditioned fear. Now, let's look at the data. Again, remember in the top left-hand corner, we've got the exposure of the stachybotrys mold spores. And now in what they did is that, again, just I just wanna uh, uh, recap on this. They, um, the mice breathed in either saline or they breathed in toxic black mold or they breathed in non-toxic black mold that had been washed with ethanol to not make it up to prime an immune challenge. And if we look at the graph on the right-hand side, because the um, bottom legend on the left-hand one uh, uh, is a little bit skewy because this is a preprint, but you can see that the NTX, which is the non-toxic mold spores, impaired memory both at 30 minutes and 24 hours later. And remember, this is not shocking the mouse. This is just playing the sound to the mouse. And you can see that there is significant differences in the ability of the mouse to actually remember the fact that the sound was connected with something that didn't feel very good. And this is an unbelievable piece of evidence because it shows that exposure to both toxic or non-toxic mold spores has the ability to impair this hippocampal memory. And really, this is just a stunning result. Now, again, looking down on this uh, maze uh, from different dimension, and I'd urge you to have a look at these mazes online. There's some great YouTube videos, but essentially it's a very simple experiment. They're just measuring how long the mouse spent in here. And they can do a couple of different types of experiments using this maze. And I'm gonna move on to the next one now. And they looked at now anxiety. And I have lost count of the number of clients who have rung me really in a very anxious state because they are concerned about the water damage and mold in their property, but also they feel anxious. And it's not just because it's unclean, it's they don't feel good. And this whole concept of not feeling good and also having this connection between the exposure to the water damage not taken seriously by, as I said, friends and families and often medical practitioners and allied healthcare practitioners, this is a real issue. And this publication demonstrates that there is a very real phenomena ha happening here and it is very serious. And again, what they wanted to look at with the uh, uh, maze again is how long the mice stay in the either open areas or the walled areas because this, uh, the time it takes, and again using image processing and an analysis, they can work out a whole lot of things about the anxiety. And so the non-toxic exposure, when the mice breathed in the non-toxic mold spores, they entered the open arms much less often. That's really, really important because that demonstrates their ability to cope with the stress of the more open environment. And this is, uh, you know, that th they also traveled much less distance. So if they did go into the more challenging or stressful environments, they didn't spend much time there. And you can see that there are wildly different relationships between the exposure to the two types of mold spores. And really, this is a, a fascinating uh, next example of the deleterious or adverse impact of the mold exposure on these mice and how they actually behave.
So we've shown that it impacts on memory. We've shown now that it increases anxiety. And now the next type of experiment that the researchers looked at is what happens to pain. And no, they didn't hurt these mice very badly at all, but they shone a light on their tail and they measure the time it takes for the tail to actually move. And so again, it's a simple and elegant experiment to measure the time it takes for the mouse to move its tail because it's in some discomfort or pain. And let's look at the results here. And the latency is the time it took to flick the tail away. And as you can see in the first bar graph, that the exposure to the non-toxic and toxic mold spores meant that their perception of pain kicked in much earlier. And this is a really a big deal because it means that people who are saying I'm in pain today, that my environment is causing me discomfort. Well, you know, they're telling the truth because the mice response supports this. And again, this is just beautiful, beautiful science here and, and a great example of uh, a, a, a wonderfully done experiment. Now, there's a lot in here. There's a very dense read. I certainly urge you to read this and share it with clinicians, but I want to talk about some of the conclusions that are in uh, this particular publication as well, because I did say that they uh, uh, were able to do a whole lot of other uh, uh, ancillary uh, work as well as measuring cognition and anxiety and pain to see how they respond physically. They did sacrifice the animals and they looked at a whole lot of uh, uh, other factors as well. And so the exposure to the toxic mold spores increased the level of something called interleukin 1 beta. And this is really an immune modulating um, uh, substance or material in the hippocampus, which is very, very strongly related to the priming of the innate immune system. Furthermore, when they sectioned the brains, they found that non-toxic mold spores decreased neurogenesis and essentially neurogenesis controls the growth and development of new neurons. So exposure to the mold decreases the ability of the brain to adapt and develop and form new connections within the brain. And of course, in young mice, exposure to non-toxic mold spores decreased the memory ability in young mice, and it also decreased pain thresholds in older mice. The take home key points here is that mold spores increase anxiety behavior. The innate immune system explains how the body responds to foreign substances invading microorganisms, and now both toxic and non-toxic mold. And the most interesting thing here is that the non-toxic mold components can also be considered as exactly that, those types of fungi which are ubiquitous in nature, very commonplace, and are not known to necessarily produce strong allergic responses. But think of all the breakdown fragments that occur. Think about even when uh, leaves break down, they fragment into smaller uh, fragments. And this breakdown phenomena is typical of what happens to most vegetative material in the world. It becomes smaller over time. And these breakdown fragments are certainly what we measure when we use optical particle counting during home inspections to measure something called PM 2.5, PM 10, which again are the indices used to quantify pollution in the air. And you know, most people think of that as pollution from vehicles and, and exhausts and uh, uh, industrialization, but it is very related to size and particulate matter 2.5 is 2.5 microns. Remember that the spores are often two, three, four, 10 microns in diameter. And over time they get sheared and they break down. Similarly, 
water damaged building elements like roofing insulation with all the wind currents that are occurring inside a typical roof void with a tiled roof they generate breakdown fragments and these breakdown fragments according to this publication are shown to be in a sense just as toxic as intact whole spores and so this issue of particulate matter and of micron and sub-micron particle challenge to the immune system affecting not only the ability of the brain to learn and uh, uh, produce a reaction like anxiety uh, and also f uh, feel pain, you can see that all of these different aspects of reactivity to the outside world are being impacted on by what we breathe. And a couple of years ago in 2016, I reviewed um, at that point, I think about six or 700 properties uh, for which areas of the home were most uh, likely to demonstrate uh, uh, particle challenges. And, and I'm gonna be reviewing this paper uh, uh, in the next few weeks. But essentially there are alternative indices to measuring mold and we need to move away from strict analysis of spore numbers to take into consideration the fact that the microbiome or the microbiome of the indoor living environment is full of a whole lot of other cellular debris and this cellular debris whether it's toxic or non-toxic appears to our physiology as producing an immune response. And this is a really, really interesting way of looking at the world because it means that we are potentially being adversely impacted on by a whole range of um, materials which may not really have a name in a sense, but may just have a size and a mass. And I will leave you on that and next week we're going to be talking further about the ramifications of this publication because I think that they will be very widespread. I think that the entire domain of the connection between behavior and cognition is really being opened up by these types of publications. And I can imagine that there is going to be a lot of linking by other scientists back and cross-referencing back to this publication because it really does establish a very firm foundation for why mold and water damage in our built environment needs to be taken extraordinarily seriously as the serious health threat it is. Thanks for tuning in and I'll see you next week. Bye for now.